Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that are coming up for sale in their April of 2016 premiere auction. And there's one here that I've wanted to take a look at for quite some time. Finally, today, found a, a really good example to show you guys. This is a Cochrane turret revolver. Now I say a turret revolver because it's a little bit different conceptually from the typical sort of revolver that we're familiar with today. When you think of revolver, what comes to mind, I'm sure, is a, uh, a modern gun where all of the, the chambers in the cylinder are all parallel with the barrel. They're all pointing downrange and they just rotate through, uh, where the, the axis of rotation is also parallel to the barrel. What, makes a, what defines a turret revolver is that the axis of rotation is actually perpendicular to the barrel. So instead of, if the barrel's pointing this way towards you guys, instead of the cylinder doing this on a turret revolver, it rotates this way. So think of the chambers as like the spokes of a wheel. They're all pointing out from the center. So here on our revolver, I've got a chamber here and here and here and here, like so. Now, this was not a very successful concept in general, uh, but there were a variety of turret revolvers that were made um, and that people attempted to sell. Now, the big problem with these, of course, is you have, whenever you're firing, you've got chambers pointed in all sorts of different directions. And should the gun chain fire, which isn't a common occurrence, but it does happen on percussion muzzle loading guns like this, should it chain fire, potential, there's potential for projectiles to go any direction, including straight back at you. Now, uh, Cochrane's gun here is better than some in that there's a big frame between you and the rear pointing uh, chamber. So if it does chain fire directly backward, excuse me. So if it does chain fire directly backwards, it's probably gonna damage the gun, but it's not actually gonna hit you. Uh, that said, this concept never took off because it was always viewed as kind of sketchy and potentially unsafe which is a legit view. Um, only about 150 of these turret revolvers were made by Cochrane, uh, so they're quite scarce today, and they're one of the, one of the best of the American-made turret revolvers. Now, that being said, to me, almost, <laughs> almost cooler than this revolver itself is the story of uh, John Cochrane, the guy who developed it. Uh, pretty precocious guy, he was born in 1814, by the age of 18, he was already making a name for himself in mechanics, in developing not just mechanical stuff, but specifically firearms. He came up with the idea for a, a multi-chambered rotary cannon, uh, the design of which we won't get into here, but suffice to say it was pretty cool. And uh, his family had some money, and three years later, age of 21, we're talking like 1832, 1833, um, he travels to Europe to show this gun to some of the continental powers, the, the English and the French specifically. He's in London, and when he demonstrates this gun, uh, a, a minister from Turkey happens to be there as well and sees the demonstration. And Apparently the French and the English weren't all that interested, but the Turkish delegation thought this was very interesting and uh, suggested that Cochrane accompany them back to Istanbul or Constantinople. This dude's like 21, 22 years old at the time, um, and here he has this design of a cannon. It's a very, you know, it's a small demonstration piece, but he takes it uh, back to Turkey. He's introduced to the Sultan of Turkey, uh, demonstrates the gun, and finds an extremely interested audience. The Sultan proceeds to, I mean, seriously, this sounds like a Disney movie or a fairy tale or something. The Sultan proceeds to uh, give him the rank of Master of Cannon, set uh, a workshop and, and as many workers as he needs at his disposal and requests that he build a full-size gun for a more significant demonstration and trial. So Cochrane uh, actually builds three of these. He builds a pair of one-pounders and he builds a 12-pounder, which is quite the substantially large cannon. Uh, according to the account I found, uh, he wasn't really happy with the skill of the workers that were assigned to him, so he ended up doing most of the work himself. Again, it's like, 21, and here he is hand building a cannon for the Sultan of Turkey, uh, demonstrates the gun and reportedly the gun fires something like 1,000 or 1,200 rounds in succession uh, in a single day without any problems, without damaging itself or destroying itself. This is the big 12 pounder. The Sultan is extremely happy with it and basically says, all right, you know, give me your bill. And Cochrane, having a, an appropriate attitude towards royalty for the time, says that he was simply happy to be of service. 
and goes home. And the next day he's summoned to the Sultan's palace where he is presented with a literal bag of gold uh, in appreciation. And uh, uh, the story kind of falls apart here. Apparently he was told there would probably be a contract coming uh, for him to come back and build a bunch more guns. That doesn't appear to have ever actually happened, but he takes this literal bag of gold back home to the US and uses it to finance himself experimenting and tinkering and developing more guns. And it's after that, in 1837, that he develops his turret revolver. So, I mean, it, seriously, how cool of a story like is, is that? Uh, it's it's kind of like secondhand lions there. At any rate, um, like I said, only made about 150 of these. The turret revolver concept never caught on. Um, there are some cool features to this one though, so why don't we take a closer look at it and uh, I'll show you what's going on inside. All right, so you can see the, the different chambers here sticking out radially from the center of this cylinder. It is a seven shot piece and it is uh, 38 caliber. So that's typical of the Cochrane revolvers, they all were. Now, now it's worth pointing out that the first US patent on the idea of having uh, a hammer automatically index and rotate a revolver cylinder, this patent was originally uh, taken out by Colonel Sam Colt, which is largely what, uh, what helped allow Colt to become uh, the, the huge behemoth of the firearms industry that it is today. Uh, for the duration of that patent, Colt was the only company that was allowed to make guns where cocking the hammer automatically indexed the cylinder. Now this system uses a, an idea that predates that, where you have a little lever right here, and this lever has a little round stud that drops into these holes. And so you actually have to manually index the cylinder each between each shot. So that's how that works. Now we can also go ahead and remove the cylinder. The uh, cylinder was actually very easy to remove for quick reloading, should you want to do that. And of course, because of the way this is set up, you'd almost certainly want to remove the cylinder in order to uh, reload the chambers. And there's really no good way to place caps on the cylinder without removing it from the gun. So the way that system works is the rear sight is actually connected to a latch. You can see that there's a pivot here. So what I do is push the rear sight forward, or I'm sorry, push the rear sight backward and lift up here. That lifts straight up, and then I can pull the cylinder straight out of the gun. So a few things to look at inside here. We have this shield on the back, which prevents any possible chain fire from hitting the shooter, which is a good idea, much appreciated. Um, the bottom plate here is brass on this one, although it's not always. This is an iron framed gun, although the grips on it are actually made of German silver. Uh, that's a somewhat older non-technical term. Uh, what the material actually is, is a nickel alloy. Nickel alloy with, uh, I believe it's 60% nickel and then like 20% zinc, 20% copper. Um, and these have this little bit of floral engraving on them. Typically you will find these with either brass grips or sometimes wooden grips. Um, the German silver here is unusual. And our barrel threaded into place right there. This gun is serial number 51, and you'll find that number on a bunch of the parts. Right. You'll see the number 51 even right there on the center screw. Now the hole right there is where the hammer reaches through. So in order to fire this piece, you would manually cock the hammer, and then when you pull the trigger, it drops. This is what's called an underhammer style of pistol for pretty self-explanatory reasons. Now, now, what's kind of interesting is this little flat spring on the bottom of the action that doesn't seem to do anything. However, when I drop the hammer, that spring hits it right at the end of travel. That spring is actually uh, for a rebounding hammer. This, while this won't prevent you from bumping the gun and firing if it happens to be situated over a live cap, this does bring the hammer down out of engagement with the caps so that it won't scrape on them so that the cylinder can revolve uh, freely. That's what that spring is for. There's no trigger guard. I suppose with a single action gun it wasn't deemed necessary and this sort of keeps stuff away from the trigger a little bit. We have a front sight. We have the rear sight here. Sight picture on this is actually pretty good. 
uh, for the time. You can see the rear sight's cut not entirely symmetrically. Sight, bring it up into the rear. There's your sight picture. Looking at the cylinder, you can see we have our serial number on the top. We have seven of these round holes, one each for each chamber. That's what locks the cylinder into position. And then on the back side, we have this brass guard to keep the, the percussion cap nipples separate. And of course, you've got seven of those, one for each chamber. So what you would do is you would load a powder and projectile into each of these. And I assume there was some sort of stand uh, that came with this or loading lever, although that's not, not extant with this gun. Anyway, you'd load each of those and then you set percussion caps on each one. And then you can go back to the pistol itself, pop the top cover open, place this in. And by the way, you can note that these caps can't fall off because this brass plate locks them in place. And we simply close our top cover until it snaps, rotate that into position. So yeah, there you can see the, the percussion caps would not be exposed, so they'd be protected from accidental impact and from falling off should they be too loose. And there you go. Cock the gun, fire, press this, manually rotate the cylinder to the next position, and so on. Now Cochrane was an inventor and designer, but he was not a full-scale manufacturer. He didn't have his own factory. Uh, he actually contracted with a guy named C.B. Allen uh, to use a manufacturing facility in Springfield, Massachusetts, as you can see here. And Allen is actually the manufacturer of all of the Cochrane guns, uh, both these turret revolvers and some other guns that, that Cochrane developed. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Very cool gun. This is, in fact, a, an interesting and rare variation of a very rare and cool gun, what with the German silver grips. So if you are interested in owning it yourself, of course, it is coming up for sale here at the very end of April of 2016. If you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to Rock Island's catalog page on this pistol. You can check out their description and their pictures and place a bid right there online. Thanks for watching.